1989. Hello. Um, there we go. I'll move. Okay. She started, um, I'm going to see here now. They didn't give me instructions, so we'll see. Okay. Um, our, the mission, which was, is to promote, maintain, and, fam and maintain a family consciousness at home, in the workplace, in the community. But our vision, which I didn't have memorized, so I had to wait till later, is that our children and our children's children will live, a live in a dynamic society, conscious of family, of work, and civic responsibilities that enrich their lives and the lives of others. And with what I've heard here this morning, I know that vision is real and that it's all a part of all of us working together. So, as I told you, the Twiga is giraffe in Swahili. And what, what ended up happening is that through this relationship with Ellen Galinsky, I had the opportunity as a nonprofit, and, and personally, but I've brought the nonprofit with me, I guess we should say, to work with her on an issue called workplace flexibility. Now, workplace flexibility means a whole lot of things to different people, but from our background of where I'm going to come through, I'm going to use this as it was defined by the Sloan Foundation. And I'll tell you, the Sloan Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, has spent around $120 million in research and data gathering over the, since the 1990s. They did it at the university level all over the country. There's a few of the Sloan centers that are still in operation. We, and they were looking for what makes an effective workplace. What's the most important part of an effective workplace? And workplace flexibility came up near the top as a tool. And many of us would say, Oh, and we've heard it all morning. That's right, and that's about time, and it's about what, what does that mean? Well, so we've tried to define workplace flexibility and not define it at the same time. And what we came up with, that workplace flexibility is a dynamic relationship between the employer and the employee that addresses how, when, and where work gets done and how careers are organized that work for both. And I hope you see in that some of the things we've talked about, about it's about relationship, it's about time, it's about, okay, it's all of those things. It's not one thing. Workplace flexibility is not telework. It's just a whole bunch of other things. Two, working with the Families of Work Institute and the Institute for Competitive Workforce and funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, we created the Alfred P. Sloan Award for Business Excellence in Workplace Flexibility and called the project When Work Works. Just as simple as that. The computer really doesn't like that title. It always underlines it several times. Um, we, we partnered with co all kinds of communities across the United States. Our goal was to share rigorous research and employer best practices, to recognize exemplary employers, and to inspire change, recognizing that workplace flexibility can work for both the employer and the employee. One of the things we found, and I think this is what I've used more than anything in the five years I've done this, after having a couple years of um, having the Sloan Award and working with communities, and we started out with eight communities. The first year we, hit, we had 39 winners. Now in, two, in um, 2009 we had 449 winners. In, in 2010 we aren't through tabulating everybody, but I'm sure it's going to be somewhere there over, over 500. And we've gone from eight communities to 30 communities, five states, and what we call an at-large category so that if you don't happen to be in any of the communities where we're working, you can just apply. And it's a, it's a um, self-selected, you go online, it's free today, don't quote me on that, two years from now, but right now it's free. <laughs> and you go online and you fill out the survey and you say, yes, I believe we have flexibility. And I can tell you, one of the things about filling out this survey is you'll learn more about flexibility than you've ever learned because you'll find out as they're, because they're collecting data from this survey all the time and they're changing the questions each time just to be sure that they're getting it. You'll fill out this survey, you'll send it in to um, the Families of Work Institute, they will tabulate, and if you are at a 70% level, they will say, okay, you're a finalist. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go survey your employees and find out if they said the same thing you said. Because very often, what will come out of the executive office won't be the same thing that the employees are feeling. And um, they'll go back, and that really makes a difference. So the award recipient, or the, or the winners, let's say, which are in the top 20% of companies across this country, 
that use, work, that use workplace flexibility, it's because the employees came back and said yes. Whether it's a practice or a policy, and we ask both questions, it doesn't have to be written down, it can be a practice. Whether it is, does what they does fit? Do you feel jeopardy if you use flexibility? And that counts against you if you do. Do you have, actually have the access even if there is a policy? Well, we found, as we looked at all of these companies, that there were um, five particular characteristics that came from this, from these surveys. And I used this when I was, uh, we did another um, research project we just finished with Boston College Center for Aging and Work, where we went to the public sector. And we, um, we contacted all 50 states. We ended up getting 27 of them who would participate, 20, 222 agencies. And this was really predicated on the fact that there's the, um, the uh, aging, the older worker, experienced worker, the older worker, is working in the public sector. In some agencies in this country, in the public sector, 100% of the people in that agency are 55 or older. And if they do retire, which they may or may not be able to, um, they will, um, it would be devastating to them. So we wanted to look at that at the public sector too. And so we use this as what we call an employer of choice. What does an employer of choice look like? What does it have? And we found these five characteristics, trust, teamwork, employees first, time for renewal, and a dual-centric employee. And I don't have time to go through each one. I think some of them are very self-evident, and many of them we talked about already this morning. But the dual-centric employee, does anybody know what that means? Jody probably does. But um, This is, we think about hiring somebody that, that is work-centric. We want to hire somebody who really wants to work. What we have really found is that the best employees are those who are what we call dual-centric, both family-centric and work-centric. They need to care about both, and they are the best employees. And if you talk to Sharon Allen, who is the chairman of the board of um, Deloitte, she will say that to her it's an ethical issue. I don't want to hire somebody who's going to make a bad decision about their family in order to meet some work need. That's, that's what we should be talking about. Um, again, what, what does workplace flexibility do? What is an effective workplace and flexibility? What does it give back to the workplace, to the to employer, and engagement, job satisfaction, overall how lower stress? We know all this. We talked about it all morning, and we know it also in the data that it's real. And I, there is a book. You can go online. This is the 2009 published version. The others will be done uh, online. It's called a guide to bold new ideas for making work work. It is all the companies that have won this across the country. I'll say 70% of them are small and medium-sized companies, but it tells you how they scored, what they do, and the kinds of workplace flexibility they have um, they created. Now, another project that we were doing at the same time, we were looking at this voluntary. We were, we were finding out what is voluntarily happening in the workplace. Then we looked at the policy side. Well. What has to happen policy side to make this work too? And what happened was that the Sloan went to Georgetown Law Clinic, created a, pro a project called Workplace Flexibility 2010, and I was lucky enough to have my foot in sort of both places. And I will be honest with you, this was because, and Georgetown doesn't have a reputation of being very conservative, they tend to be on the more liberal, so they said, you gotta hire Patricia Kempthorn so we can balance this out so it looks good to our board of directors. Okay. I'm, you know, that's great with me. I've gotten to work with some of the most dynamic, fascinating, amazing, um, mostly women but not all lawyers from Georgetown that I never would have done had I been in any way. And they, and I, yes, I am the Republican there, and they try to shock me, and I shock them back when I can and say, you know, and they say, well, you're not as conservative as you think you are. And I said, you're not as liberal as you think you are. We're all there together if we just keep working this. And that's exactly what our goal is in this project to ease the mismatch between the structure of how work gets done and what the needs are of the workforce of, of people. And, you know, there's, again, we're looking at the benefits, and I wanna, I'm want i going to have to move through these, but the PowerPoints will be up on the um, website so you can kind of see them. And this comes right out of, of the work that we did that identify what we need to do to ease the mismatch. We ended up dividing it into three buckets, flexible work arrangements, time off, and career flexibility. And what we did is we put together bipartisan groups of people, and we did for five years. We've been talking to them on both sides to say, what does this mean? And what we found under flexible work arrangements from a policy standpoint was that we couldn't come to a consensus on a policy, and flexible work arrangements are those things, you know, the time, place we work. 
But we did find that maybe there were some things that the federal government could do, particularly, but all the government could do in order to lead this. And what I did bring you, so please take it because I don't want to take them home, is a copy of the Public Policy Platform of Flexible Work Arrangements. There's copies over there. And this is, there was a, a five-pronged approach. I don't know if I put it in here. I want to see if I did. Um, I may not have. Um, there it is. Um, on work, flexible work arrangements. And this idea is we aren't going to make a policy about it, but there are things the government can do to make a difference. They can make the case for it. They can lay the groundwork. They can invest in innovation. They can lead by example, and they can create an infrastructure. And one of the ways they've done that is we put together a Senate study group on it. And I'm, and I'm very proud that my own Senator Mike Crapo from Idaho, which again is considered a very conservative place, and he's conservative, he, saw, he sees flexibility as really important. For him, it's about children's health and being able to take care of children. This goes back to one of our earlier speakers. And this one, and also Congressman um, McCarthy from New York. But there's um, Blanche Lincoln also from Nebraska. Arkansas, we have, we have worked with. So it is a bipartisan discussion. The other thing that I, and this, as I'm getting to the end, I want to tell you that this is National Work and Family Month, and I don't know if you knew that when you planned this, but this is a great month to have this, this celebration. Um, World at Work, which is out of Arizona, and another group called AWLP, who are leaders in issues, particularly HR issues, and stuff, around work and family. This is, this is their logo, and it's about self, career, family, community. They helped get a Senate and House resolution so that we could make this an official work and family. So policy-wise, at least the conversation is there. And the White House on March 31st, 2010, had a White House forum on workplace flexibility that the, both the President and the First Lady came to. And, just, and I can tell you, I was sitting in Idaho watching the video stream but I've waited 20 years for any president, particularly a president of the United States, to stand up and say this. And, and another quote that I don't have here, but he, did, he said, the most important work we do is taking care of our family and our loved ones. And I'm sure I jumped out of my chair and said, thank you for saying it. Now, what will it do? Where will it go? I don't know. I, in my opinion, it should have been on the headline of every paper the next day. But the press didn't see it that way. So if you, if you want more information, this is, this is what we've been doing. And I can tell you, as our projects start coming to an end, the Sloan funding have been very generous to us. We've been working this through for seven years. We will continue. SHRM, which is the Society of Human Resource Management, which a few years ago would say, ah, workplace flexibility is kind of interesting. The quote from SHRM today is, we will own workplace flexibility. This is good for where we're going. Um, there's lots more to um, know. Get to find out on winworkworks.org, the Twigga Foundation, or workplaceflexibility2010.org. My concern is that as the funding goes away, the issue fades away, and I'm trying to figure out a way to keep it going. So with the help of all the people here, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Thank you very much.